Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Well, what a difference a day makes. On President Biden's very first full day in office, he put his focus directly on the COVID pandemic. We're in a national emergency and it's time we treat it like one. Together, the national plan as the United States of America. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the pandemic and the plan that Biden is rolling out to use the full power of the federal government to combat it. We'll also speak with a former senator who knows both Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell very well. She'll tell us about whether or not she believes the two men can work together to get things done. And a freshman congresswoman from California, she'll join us to discuss how she wants to not only hold the people accountable for the attack on the Capitol, but she also is focusing on the Pentagon and whether or not active duty members were involved. We'll also get the inside scoop on the upcoming impeachment trial, which could begin as early as next week, and then all the challenges that Biden is facing and more. That with our good friend, ABC News political director, Rick Klein. But first, the latest on COVID and the president's plan to fight it. Now, he rolled that out today, and he also took shots at how the Trump administration handled the crisis. For the past uh, year, we couldn't rely on the federal government to act with the urgency and focus and coordination we needed. And while the vaccine provides so much hope, the rollout has been a dismal failure. Now, to make matters worse, the new administration was left with no vaccine distribution plan from the outgoing Trump folks. The Trump administration was given 36 million doses when they were in office for 38 days. They administered a total of about 17 million shots. That's about uh, less than 500,000 shots a day. What we are proposing is to double that to about 1 million uh, shots per day. The Trump administration left us with no plan. So far, more than 17 million people have been vaccinated, as you heard there, with the first dose, which is way behind schedule. Biden, though, saying he wants to pick up the pace substantially so that number, that 100 million more people getting the shot in the first 100 days will be the benchmark here. And we're hearing behind the scenes they even want to exceed that number. But to get all that done, he's pledging, and these are his words, a full-scale wartime effort. Today, I'm signing an executive action to use the Defense Production Act and all other available authorities to direct all federal agencies and private industry to accelerate the making of everything that needs to protect, test, vaccinate, and take care of our people. Well, we've already identified suppliers, and we're working with them on to move the plan forward. The big headline to take away from all this is, instead of delegating it every state for themselves, he says the federal government is going to take the lead here. Biden also signed executive orders creating a board to increase testing capacity, another one that will require masks on federal property, and yet another one that steps up data collection that will help health officials fight the virus. Now, Biden also confirmed that science is back and politics this time around will not play a role. Our plan is to restore public trust. We will make sure that science and public ex scientists and public health experts will speak directly to you. That's why you're going to hear a lot more from Dr. Fauci again, not from the president, but from the real genuine experts and scientists. We're going to make sure they work free from political interference and they make decisions strictly based on science and health care alone, science and health alone. Now, that is obviously a huge change from what we got from the outgoing administration and president. A few minutes later, Dr. Fauci, he took to the microphone and he was asked about the difference in his job going from Trump to Biden. It was very clear that there were things that were said, uh, be it regarding things like hydroxychloroquine and other things like that, that really was an uncomfortable because they were not based on scientific fact. I can tell you, I, I take no pleasure at all in being in a situation of contradicting the president. So it was really something that you didn't feel that you could actually say something and there wouldn't be any repercussions about it. The idea that you can get up here and talk about what you know, what the evidence, what the science is, and know that's it. Let the science speak. It is somewhat of a liberating feeling. Simple, 
but substantial. Now, this comes as the pandemic continues to rage really out of control. More than 408,000 Americans have died, including 4,400 in just the last 24 hours. Get your arms around that. We're still averaging 3,000 fatalities each and every day. The Biden administration says we will likely hit half a million COVID-related deaths next month, and it will likely take months after that for them to turn this thing around. Now, I want to bring in my first guest to discuss. That's Congressman Jake Auchincloss. He, a Democrat from Massachusetts and a Marine Corps veteran who's now a major in the reserves. Congressman, I can just imagine a question your office fields every day from a lot of seniors saying, when am I going to be able to get the vaccine? Um, we heard today from the Biden folks through back channels that they basically were given no playbook, uh, no game plan from the outgoing administration. But what do you tell folks? Are you confident that the new team, I know they've set up a, a game plan, 100 million vaccines uh, to be distributed in the first 100 days. Are they going to get to that number? Do they have their act together? Thanks for having me on. I am confident that the new team can sprint, but they are starting from a full stop. The Trump administration was woefully incompetent. Uh, science did the impossible, including many scientists here in Massachusetts, in creating a vaccine in about 300 days when it should take 10 years. But there was no preparation for the vaccination uh, distribution. Uh, we need to be doing both logistical and clinical work to ensure that we can get a million shots in arms every day for the first 100 days of the Biden administration. That means uh, trials to determine whether we can mix and match, safety trials for those who are pregnant or, uh, and for children, uh, understanding the latency between doses, and of course, uh, scaling up the actual sites at which people can receive the shots, like at Gillette Stadium in my own district. You sit on the Financial Services Committee. Uh, to me, uh, there's a lot of things that are hard to understand of Washington, but one of the things I thought would get bipartisan support would be a major stimulus package, especially with the election behind us. Uh, listen, D.C. spends money on things sometimes we don't even need, but nobody debates. A lot of people are hurting and certainly a lot of businesses on their last legs. Why is this so hard to get done? I don't understand why all of a sudden people are finding religion on fiscal uh, prudence here. Get the money out. I, that's what I consistently hear. I don't see the political objection to it and all of a sudden the pay go that we're getting from the other side of the aisle. Uh, I think you're talking to the wrong party on this one. Republicans all of a sudden, once Donald Trump left office, found their... Uh found fiscal prudence once again, it seems. Uh, no, we need to be spending money right now. We got to worry about the deficit. It is a significant sustainability issue for the next generation. But these first 100 days is not the time to be worrying about the deficit. We've got a natural disaster on our hands. We've got to be spending money on vaccinations. We've got to be spending money on relief for state and local governments, for small businesses, for working families. Uh, every dollar we spend that shortens this pandemic by even one day has tremendous ROI. And, you know, to me, uh, we've spoken to governors, uh, it, red or blue, states are hemorrhaging money here, um, and they're not going to turn around soon. And the, and the cuts they would have to make or the taxes they'd have to raise um, would be beyond painful. To me, that's another question, Congressman. I don't get the political objection on this because every state needs it regardless of whether they have a Republican or Democrat governor. Do you think that's going to be in the final package? That's going to get done. Well, I think of the cities and towns in my own district, the Massachusetts 4th, Taunton, Attleboro, Fall River, Franklin, Easton, Sharon. These are cities and towns that are going to require federal assistance for their upcoming fiscal year to avoid cuts in education and infrastructure and public safety and uh, general civil services. Uh, fiscal budgets for cities and towns tend to be lagging indicators of recession. So this upcoming fiscal year is gonna be harder than the last one and, and FY 2022 could be even harder still. So we've gotta provide relief. I will certainly be a champion for it. I'm talking to state and local officials on a weekly basis to determine what their needs are and how we can ensure that the federal government is there to backstop them. All this obviously in the backdrop about what we saw uh, January 6th. And it, you have a unique perspective on this. I mentioned in the intro, uh, you came to Congress, uh, and in your background, you were in the military and were still a reservist. I've heard folks from law enforcement that day who had served tours who said it was the closest thing they remember from being literally infantry in combat. Um, what was it like that day for you, and did you ever think when you went to Washington, anything remotely approaching that would resemble what you saw when you represented our country in uniform? 
It was a dark day for democracy, but we did not let an insurrectionist mob derail us from doing our constitutional duty. We certified electoral results and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were sworn in as the next leaders of this country. And that is what I want us to focus on. Yes, we have to be vigilant uh, about preventing any violence in the coming weeks and months, but I want us to keep our, our eyes facing forward on how we are going to root out white supremacy and fight for racial justice, how we are going to take on climate change, and of course, how we are going to confront this pandemic and put it behind us. I think we are on the cusp of a new roaring 20s, but to do that, we have got to draw a line under this plague and build an economy that works for everybody. Finally, to root out um, these elements, uh, people point to Oath Keepers, a lot of the militias, and that there is uh, a lot of folks who used to wear a uniform who are in their ranks. I don't know what the real number is, but how big of a problem is it, whether it be law enforcement or former military, that some of these folks, you know, find a home in these groups here? It exists, and I don't want to suggest otherwise. The military has a problem with this. It's one of the reasons I supported the waiver for general, uh, for retired General Lloyd Austin to be the next Secretary of Defense. I think he's well suited to take on that task, and I think it's important and historic to swear in the first African American to be SecDef. However, I don't want to overstate it either. The military is not overrun with white supremacists. The military was one of the first institutions in this country to integrate. It remains. Uh, one of the highest character, highest integrity institutions in this country. And I don't want to uh, to somehow devalue all the work it has done. Absolutely. Uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you. I appreciate you making time for us today. Congressman, thank you. Be well. All right, folks, we come back. A former senator who served with both Biden and McConnell. She'll join us to discuss whether or not the two men will be able to work together. Send an impeachment trial that lies ahead and obviously a host of more challenges.